recording now. Okay. And we're unmuted. Good morning, everyone. And Baton Rouge and Lake Charles. We're going to get started in a couple of minutes. We're just waiting for some people in Metro. All right. Hmm. Yeah, whenever they talk, if they unmute their microphones, okay, then they'll talk back to you. That you'll hear it out of this. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, it's uh, I've got after nine o'clock, so um, I think we had a little problem with getting here. Uh, you all may not know that the causeway is closed due to uh, fog, and so a lot of the traffic had to go around to slide down. So they may uh, make it for the next class. Uh, and not this class. So traffic is pretty bad in, in our area right now. So I'm just going to uh, go ahead and start it since you all, you all are there. Uh, can you all hear me? If somebody unmute, just let me know. In Lake Charles, we can hear this now. Okay, good. Who do I have in Lake Charles? Christina. Christina, hi, Christina. I think, it, I think it's just me today, but I'll keep the door open for a little bit and see if we have anybody. Yeah, how about Baton Rouge? Who do we have in Baton Rouge? Hey, we've got we we've got three here right now, but we usually have some that'll trickle in in the next few minutes. <laughs> um, that might be what happens here if they get in before uh, we have finished, not sure. Anyway, I'm Carolyn DeLise, and I am the manager of this office, uh, where the training firm is, Metro, we call it the Metro office. So welcome, everybody. Let's get started uh, with our first form that we're going to talk about. I guess you all have packets, is the contract information form. If y'all would get that form out. Okay. Oh, sorry. Sorry. We're going to start with agency. <laughs> Customer information form. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, you all may see it as the form up there on the screen right now. There's also another form that, um, let's see, I don't see it on here. All right. There's also another form that some use, and it's kind of like, a, um, if you all can see my screen, I don't know if you can, let me know if you can. It's it's like a little brochure, and that's how we kind of started with this. It was, it was blue. I still have some of these in my office. Uh, it was just a pamphlet format. Originally, when they did it, it had little cute characters on it, and a lot of the commercial agents said, we're not using that. So they changed the form into a one-page uh, customer information form, and I think most people probably use that uh, right now. Do any of you all know when this started, when agency started? If you want to unmute, you can answer that question. And I'll put it up here. It's not on here. I thought it was on here. Okay. What year was agency created in Louisiana law? Anybody want to guess? Well, it started in 1997, but it was not put into effect until 1998. Uh, I've been licensed since 1981, so when I got licensed, we were realtor associates. We weren't realtors back at, in that day. We all worked for the seller. I know that's kind of hard to believe, but we did. We all worked for the seller, no matter who we had in our car. Uh, if we were driving around with buyers, didn't matter. We didn't work for the buyer. We worked for the seller. Uh, there was a term called caveat emptor. 
uh, back then, let the buyer be aware. So uh, it was good that it came into play and we were happy about it, that once we became an all relative board, we were able to say we represented the person that we had in our car and drove around and showed the property. So that was a big change for us uh, back in, in that day. But the agency relationship you all probably have when you got licensed, the agency uh, relationship in which there is with the broker, and then there's a designated agency. You all are the designated agent of the buyer or the seller, depending on who you represent. Uh, so you can have this designated agency form signed. Uh, it used to say first face-to-face -face contact. That's a little cumbersome because when you met somebody at an open house, you had to ask them to sign this form. They didn't know you, you didn't know them, but that's the way the law was written. It was first face-to-face -face contact. So later on, they changed it to first face-to-face -face substantive contact. So that means now you're talking to them about financing, you're talking to them about properties, you're all into those discussions. Uh, that's when you have to have this form signed. Every buyer and every seller has to have this form signed that you all work with. So it doesn't matter which one it is. It just matters that you have to have this form signed. It's a required form in SkySlope. I don't know if y'all got through SkySlope yet, but it's a required form in SkySlope Sky uh, on the buyer side and on the seller side, the person you represent. That little signature line at the bottom it says buy, and then there's a title. So buy is by the person that's signing the form. The title could be an executor, executrix, whatever, a uh, attorney, you know, whatever, whatever their title might be. Or it might be just blank because you're working with a buyer and, and a, or a seller. So um, that question comes up quite a bit. What does that mean? What do we have to, where do we sign? Because most of the time it's signing says a buyer or it says uh, a seller, a purchaser. Um, so uh, that's the, you know, this form's a little different. Real Estate Commission, uh, you know, put this form together. So we have to sign it uh, and it's, that's the way it is. You have to keep this form for five years. This, actually this form is not, the broker is not required to keep this form. You're required to keep this form. Uh, if the commission ever wanted to, they could ask you to produce it. Uh, but we keep it for you, and we put it in SkySlope just in case uh, you're ever asked for it. If the commission has the right to come in and inspect our forms, um, we used to have file cabinets, and they had a right any time they wanted you to just walk in your office and start looking through your file cabinet. Um, I haven't heard of anybody doing that in quite a few years, but they they did they did do it. Uh, now everything is on SkySlope, so we can go to SkySlope and produce that form if the commission asked us. That's why it's so important uh, that you keep that form and keep it for five years. Any questions? We're going to talk about dual agency uh, because that's a separate form, so we're going to talk about that um, after this. Any questions on the customer information form? Nope. Okay. This is the dual agency form. This is the, the next form that we're going to talk about um, is dual agency. Dual agency is when you are representing the seller and you're representing the buyer. You may have a listing that you're holding open and someone comes in and they just love that property and they want to put it on for an hour right now. So what do you do? First off, you should have had the dual agency form signed when you take the listing. It's also a required form. Now, there are clients that do not want you to do dual agency, and that's okay. You can just run a line through it and, uh, that, that they don't want dual agency and put it in SkySlope. But we need to have that form signed so that we need to know that you, the, the seller has made that determination whether you can have it or not. And sometimes, too, the buyer can make that determination. I don't, you're the listing agent. I don't want you representing me. Oh. I don't want you representing me. I want my own agent. So um, they're not going to sign the dual agency form. 
Uh, this has always been kind of a contentious area in dual agency because usually uh, when there's a lawsuit, a lot of times it's over dual agency because one side or the other didn't feel that they were being protected. They felt, oh, you're just working for the seller or oh, you're just working for the buyer and you're not representing me in any fashion. But to do dual agency, you are kind of like doing ministerial acts. You're saying, okay, Mr. Buyer, you know, what do you want to offer for this property? And then you go to the seller and say, okay, they want to offer through 10. You can't say to the seller, they're offering 310, but I know they'll go to 325. That you cannot say that. Same way with the seller, when the seller tells you, okay, I'm gonna counter this offer. But if they don't take it, I'll go down. Can't say that either. So you have to be very careful when you're doing dual agency. Make sure that all the, the confidential information is confidential. And that's it's for you. That's why it makes it a little, a little challenging uh, when you're doing dual agency. The risk is high when you're doing this. But you do have to have this form. It's a required form. So if you take a listing and they don't want it, just run a line through it, sign it. They don't want your agency and put it in Sky Slow. Any questions? Okay. You know, the, I know the traffic was bad and the weather is and foggy and really thin. So I wasn't sure if anybody wanted from the listing. I got stuck on the bridge. Yeah, the bridge or the causeway we shut down. So I didn't know if I got anybody here. That's okay. Um, so that's dual agency. Anybody have any questions on dual agency? Okay, so I'm gonna sit. I'm gonna try to split my, my vision between this is for all the time. Because <laughs> there are people online. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So here's a here's a question for you. Let's see. I think we went over this first thing. We went over the, what year was agency created in Louisiana law? It was in 1997, but it was enacted in 1998. So that's when we became an all realtor board. Here's one, fact or fiction. Mona Lisa was painted by Vincent Van Gogh in the 17th century. Fact or fiction? What do y'all think? That version? Y'all can unmute any time. Back to fiction, yes. False. False. It was in the 16th century or 15th century, wasn't it? Between like 50 The Mona Lisa was painted by Martin da Vinci. <laughs> in the early 1500s, you got that right, the early 1500s. That's the wrong painter. <laughs> All right, so let's move on to wire fraud. This is kind of a hot topic uh, in our area for sure. Um, all areas probably with wire fraud. With people having the capability of, you know, taking your email account or your client's email account or getting to the email bo a box, this form is probably one of the most critical forms we have, which is the wire fraud alert, which is whether you represent the buyer or whether you represent the seller, you have to produce this form and have them sign it. And it talks about, we don't just willy-nilly give wire fraud, um, I mean, give wire information out to people because we need to protect our emails. And they're so, they're so good at it today that sometimes you don't even know it. If they send something to Ladder and Bloom, B-O-U-N, and not B-O-U-M, would your eye catch it right away? We have had a few cases of wire fraud. We're fortunate that they were caught and people didn't lose money, but I hear from the title companies that that's not the case. I know one, one lost $400,000 because she, um, she wired money and they never got it. And it's very hard to track that to get it back. But there's lots and lots of wire fraud going on. So you have to be very careful um, when you're talking to your clients about wiring funds before they do it, they need to call whoever, if they're wiring a, a deposit to Ladder and Bloom or they're wiring their deposit to the title company, they need to talk to a live person 
and get the instructions. And then what I do is I call them, um, set it up, and then have them call me back when they got the instructions. And then, of course, we tell them these instructions are not going to change. If you get any kind of email from me saying the wiring instructions have been changed, call me right away because they haven't been changed. But the scam artists are really good about catching uh, people's email and making little changes, and they send it to the person, and they might copy the agent, the title company, but there's one little number off. Or it's, a, it's a capital and not a small letter, something they do uh, that it to the uh, naked eye, it just you kind of look over it and you know, they don't see it. So be very, very careful in any time you you're in, you know somebody asks you about wiring instructions to them. And that's why we have this form sign. We do have wiring uh, fraud insurance uh, to cover a lot of things, but um, not everybody does, and sometimes it, it you know it hurts the buyer or the seller in trying to get their money. So this is one form. Spend a little time talking to them about it um, before they sign it. Don't just say this is a this is another form that Latin Blue wants us to sign. No, go over this form and really, really talk to them to protect them, and that's what we're trying to do: protect them um, in not losing their money you know, on putting in a deposit or on the seller side either. Any questions on that? So whether you represent the buyer or you represent the seller, they sign that. We don't have, you know, it's not for uh, other brokers or anything. This is a form specific to Latin Blooms. And this is what we present to our buyer if we're representing our buyer or to the seller if we're representing the seller. This form also goes in Skyslope. It's an internal form. Uh, we don't send this form uh, when you're doing your contract or sending your contract out to other brokers. This form is not included. Any questions? Okay. This is going to be a quick class. <laughs> Y'all are so quiet. Okay, let's go move on to the contract information sheet. <clears throat> this is another um, important sheet because this is how we get paid on a transaction and it form has to be completely filled out. If not, the an accountant will kick it back and say it needs to be filled out. So let's look at the form, uh, the MLS number at the top, followed by the property address, the complete address, and the buyer's name and the seller's name. And if there's a co-broker involved or you're the, you know, the broker or the buyer and there's a, a listing agent involved, then all that information needs to go here. You can get that off the front of your contract. <clears throat> if you can't understand it for a buyer, if you don't represent the buyer or whatever, look at the property disclosure or another one of the sheets that can you know clearly identify who the buyer is or the seller is because they really want that information. The next little line under listing source, you're going to put other if it's not an EE, a relocation property, um, Rocket Mortgage or Op City. Uh, then just check other. And then the buyer's address after the sale. Um, we know the buyer's moving into that house, but we don't know, uh, you know, if we don't have the buyer, then maybe it's an investment property and maybe we just don't know their address. So just you can leave that one blank. The next part is the pending information. So if you are a member of Jisrin, then across the top, you would check it's active under contract or it's pending or contingent, predication, backup offer, or whatever it is. If you're a member of Greater Southern, they have active under contract and pending. The value board has under contract backup offers and predication. And then the Greater Baton Rouge board, pending, pending continue to show, contingent. Uh, then realtors, this is Lafayette, pending and active, flash contingent. So they all have different things, different little um, initials that they use. So whatever board, uh, whatever MLS you are a member of, that's the one you look at and that's the one you check. Property type. So if it's residential, you just put an X in the residential, multifamily, vacant land, commercial, whatever it is. The next line is the original list price. So what did the price actually start at? 
And then what's the actual contract price? What's the end, end price? The date the contract is accepted. So that means the last person to sign that contract, if you have counters going back and forth, the last uh, date is the date of the acceptance. And then what is the closing date? Whatever you have in your contract for the closing group. The next line is the commission due. Is it due ladder bloom? Uh, or do we have a listing? Do we have a selling or other? So it could be maybe we don't have, you know, maybe it's a Lisbo or something, but they want to know what the commission is. So if you represent the list side, you just put the list side. You don't have to put the other side because that's not what we're getting. We're only getting the listing side. And then who's holding the deposit? Is it Ladder and Bloom? Is it the other broker? Is it the title company? And then what the deposit amount is. Um, Ladder and Bloom always likes to hold that deposit if we are the listing broker, because uh, if you bring that deposit to a third party, to a title company, then they are not under the same rules and regulations as the listing brokers are. So as a listing broker, if we're holding that deposit, and there's a dispute between the buyer and the seller, who gets the deposit, we as a listing broker can make that determination. Now there's a process we have to go through. The real estate commission says, within 60 days, you have to do something with that deposit. So we have to send out letters to the buyers and the sellers, we copy the agent and we say, okay, you know, both parties want that deposit. So we ask them, why do they feel that they deserve that deposit. We get that information back and then we sit and look at that contract and make an opinion based on the terms of the contract. Once we do that, we have to send out another letter and saying, okay, we feel that the buyer deserves their money back. And then we have to wait 10 more days before we can give that money back. If it's not clear cut of who gets their money back, then we can do a concursus and we send it to our attorney who puts it in the, the court. If that happens, then the buyer and the seller have to go to court. They have to hire an attorney and fight over that money. Sometimes it's not worth it because it's not enough to pay their attorney and then their court costs and all that and fight over it. So sometimes they'll agree to split that deposit or, you know, 75, 25, whatever the case may be, if they can come to terms, then we can release the deposits to those parties. But we can't release the deposit unless we have a cancellation sign and stating where that money's going. Whereas a title company, they usually don't, they don't do the format that we have to do because they're not, um, you know, they're not members of the real estate commission like we are. So they usually send it to court. They'll wait a, a period of time but they're not going to make the determination as a broker will make that determination. Any questions on that? Uh, it doesn't happen a lot, but I've, I've had it quite a few times in my career where I've had to make the determination and I have made the determination because sometimes it's real clear cut in the contract of one person defaulted on that agreement, you know, and if they default on the agreement, sometimes the seller just okay, my property's been off the market for so long and, and they still can't, you know, the buyer can't get their loan. No fault of theirs, they just can't get the loan. Well, they should get their deposit back. But sometimes the buyer, the seller, you know, digs their heels in and they said, no, my property's been off the market for 30 days and I want that deposit. So they don't get it. Or during the inspection period, you know, they have the right to get, it's the out clause, we call it. But the seller won't sign off on the, you know, on them getting their money back. So those are pretty clear cut. We're giving the money back, but we still have to go <clears throat> through the process of the letters and determination letter and then wait 10 days and then we'll give the money back. So we've done it, I've done it many a times, but uh, you know, it's just the it, it's unrealistic of somebody, the seller not giving the money back because sometimes agents don't sit with the seller and explain to them what happens with that deposit. They think they don't get it if that contract doesn't go through. And that's not that's not always the case. Sometimes it is, and the buyer just didn't show up for the sale. You know, things like that happen, uh, all kinds of reasons. But uh, that's what happens to the deposit. 
The commission split between agents. Sometimes there's teams that work together, two people work together, uh, and accounting has to know. Is one team member getting 75 and the other is getting 25, or are they splitting it 50-50? That's what goes on these commission between, or between agents, even if they're not a team. They're just kind of helping each other and they decide that they're gonna work together and just um, on this transaction and they're gonna split it 50-50. So that's what they do. Um, and then the other one is the referral. So if there's a referring side to someone, someone in Metairie gave a referral to somebody in Baton Rouge and it's a 30% referral fee, that's what goes on there. And it's off what, whatever side they're referring to. This bottom section is strictly for the closing. So once this sheet is completed and put in sky slow, it just kind of sits there until you're ready to go to the act of sale. Once you go to the act of sale and you come back with your commission check and your uh, closing disclosure and cash sale, then you fill out the bottom of this. The date it closed, what it closed for, what type of loan, if they did repairs or closing costs, if a warranty was paid, if seller paid points, who the mortgage title and insurance company is. Sometimes you don't know that uh, information if you just represent the seller. You definitely know who the title company is, but sometimes you don't know the other things. So fill out what you know, and then that goes into, uh, that goes when they deposit your commission checks, this goes into accounting so that you can get paid. Any questions on that? Okay. And you don't have to fill out another form at the bottom. Um, you know, just take put the keep a copy of this one, uh, and then when you go to sale, just fill out the bottom and turn it in. Questions on the contract information? Excuse me. Do you have another advisor? Uh, it does find you up here. Oh, wait, this is somebody, I don't know my name here. Thank you so much. I've been waiting to get it. That's right. You, you signed in, huh? Everybody yes. signed in? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Fact or fiction, real agency is illegal in Florida and Texas, which I've been there. Well, Not all states allow you to do dual agency. So it's a fact. It is illegal in Florida and Texas. They will not allow their agents to, to do dual agency. All right. Trivia. What's the largest privately owned home in the United States? Anybody know? I'll give you all a hint to North Carolina. Oh, okay. That was <laughs> Anybody get a clue? Okay. It's the Biltmore States. It's located in Asheville in North Carolina. It's 178,926 square feet. <laughs> and there it is. Pretty big house. Anybody been there? I've been there like long time. two or three times. Yeah, it's an awesome. If you haven't been there, it's an awesome place. It's just like they have one so much. It's so much glitz and glamour. You know, England's uh, queen's been there. The, well, I don't know if it's the queen, but but the king now was there. Um, it's a it's amazing if you ever go go behind do the behind the scenes tour because that is amazing in itself. Okay. Our next form is the affiliated business disclosure. This came about um, actually in 2011 when the CFPB, which is the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, was created. And it was in response to the financial crises in 2007 and 8. Um, they implemented it for protection for consumers. Um, what caused the 2007, 2008 was mortgage fraud, credit and fraud and credit agencies and things, what happened, they were making loans to people that 
couldn't afford them. That's what happened, basically. And they were being foreclosed on. And there was so much foreclosure back in 2007 and 2008 that they created this uh, this protection bureau so that they could go in and, and uh, look at mortgage companies and credit agencies and things and see that there was a lot of fraudulent behavior going on at that time. So they created this bureau and now we have to disclose if we have uh, provide another service and we get compensation from that service. You all know we have an insurance company, Lionel Insurance. We also have uh, Essential Mortgage, which is our mortgage company. And of course, if someone uses that and you know that benefits Lionel Bloom, we have to disclose that. Back in this time in 2011, when all of this came out, things were a little crazy. And if you had a, a buyer and a seller, they couldn't even be in the same closing together. They had to be in different rooms. Hence, it used to be a HUD statement. You got a HUD statement when you close the buyer side, seller side, they were all in the same form. Everybody knew. When the new closing disclosures came out, there was a closing disclosure for the buyer and a closing disclosure for the seller. And neither party knew what was on the other one's disclosure. So it really became real cumbersome back in that time for us uh, as agents uh, and the title company because they had to make provisions for separate people in separate rooms and the clothes and it was just kind of crazy back there. Um, but now you'll see that sometimes the buyers and sellers are back in the same room, but they're not in separate rooms. Today. So you gotta look at how long ago that was when all of this happened, all of this came about. Um, the CFPB had what well, is kind of an autonomous um, organization where they're, you know, they don't really kind of have a boss. So they were coming down on mortgage company, um, looking at everything and putting these big fines. I mean, they could be fined up to half a million dollars from the CFPB and they couldn't do anything about it. So it's a big organization that, you know, kind of oversees mortgages and making sure that everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing. Hence, they got rid of those mortgage loans that were, they used to call them no doc. No doc meant you walked into a room and with your loan originator and you said, I make $300,000 a year. And they said, great, we'll give you a loan. They did not do any paperwork. They did not go and uh, see if that's the truth. So that's where they started making all these crazy, crazy loans. And in 2000, 2008, things started to go south and a lot of people couldn't afford these mortgages what they got. And so there was a lot of foreclosure uh, back in that day. So in essence, now we have a form that says affiliated business disclosure statement, and you have to give that to every buyer you represent and every seller you represent because a seller could also be the buyer, you know, at any time. So this is a required form that goes in Skyslope. It also uh, does not go anywhere else. It's an internal form that everybody has to sign, all your clients. So um, that kind of is the, the third form that uh, goes in your packet with signatures that stay in, in the office. So there's affiliated business, there's wire fraud, and there's agency. Those three forms are signed with every client you represent on the higher side and the sellers. So just know, in addition to those marketing agreements and MLS and all that stuff that, that goes in, these three forms go in every one of your, um, your transactions. Anybody have a question on affiliated business? I'm sorry, can you make the three forms again? The agency, the affiliated business, and the wire fraud. Okay. And of course, dual agency, that's another one that just kind of became a required form not too long ago. But these, all of these forms are internal forms, 
they don't go out of the office. They don't go to the cooperating broker. They don't get attached to the purpose agreement going out of the office. Only for your internal um, when you're doing your forms. All right. Any question on that? And and all these forms are interactive. Like with when I'm with the client, we need to sign. I can just open up my laptop. Can I? I can get it through Delta Net to SkySlope, and they just sign right then and there. You can you can send them through. Um, Open to sign and have them all signed. Okay. Um, you can just, you know, your package, there should be packages in there and you can have them all signed at, at one time. Okay. It's just that we want you to go through them with your clients and tell them what, what it is they're signing, you know. Right. We you know a lot of people do it through um, through electronic signatures and that's okay. And you can you can line them up, set them up where they can sign right there on the open to sign. Gotcha, thank you. Okay, Let's see, price change and extensions. So this is uh, this is a form where you're going to ex extend your marketing agreement. Uh, you know, you want to get that done before it's over, before it ends, uh, so that you don't have any problems. You know, that it expired off the MLS, and you have to put put it all in new again. So just get your extension signed a couple of weeks before. It's time, so you'll have that ready to put in. The seller has to initial it. This is a form that your manager has to initial. So make sure if you're setting it up in Authenticide that the seller signs first and you sign second and your manager always signs last. Uh, I do get some that come in with no signatures on them. And I get it, and then I have to send an email to the agent. I sign last. Set it up where the the um, seller signs first. And you sign second. Same thing with the price decrease. The seller has to initial, and the manager has to initial uh, if they're doing a decrease or if they're doing an increase. Whatever the price change is, they can do it either way. And then any other changes uh, that need to go on there. Seller initials, manager initials. And then the seller signs, the designated agent signs, so that would be you. And then and then your manager signs last. And then that form goes in sky slope. Questions on that one? Okay. This is the one we don't like to see. This is your early expiration form. And this one says that, you know, for whatever happens, I don't know what happens. Sometimes sellers say, you know, I really can't afford to sell it anymore. Uh, I need to just rent it and my cousin's going to rent it. So you're going to be allowed to terminate the agreement. You fill in the, the date, the property address, MLS, your name, and when is it going to terminate on. And then in, in the bottom, if you see that bold print, it says it is further understood and agreed that seller will owe broker the full commission stated in the listing agreement should the seller sell a lease or otherwise transfer ownership at the property prior to the original expiration date, and you put that in there. Some owners hate that uh, that clause, and you know we usually leave it up to the agent and the manager to talk about it and whether you want to x that clause off, because sometimes they've met somebody and they're just trying to get out of the listing so they don't have to pay you a commission. So we want to really be careful about taking that statement out of there. Um, because it's a protection for you. If you know for sure, you know these people and you know that they're in a bind or, or they decide not to sell, they want to stay in the house, so life change for them, uh, and you want to let them out, that, that's fine. It also states, uh, seller shall further agrees to reimburse water and balloon its marketing expenses. And I've seen that where the seller has paid the agent back for the pictures. Those pictures some of them are expensive, depending on what you do. Uh, and so they've written a check back to the, you know, to do those expenses. Uh, we reimburse, they'll reimburse letter and bloom, and then we'll just, you know, send it, send it through uh, in and out for the, for the agent. And then the seller signs the expiration, effective expiration date, the manager signs. And in Baton Rouge, they have a different system with lock boxes. So that line down at the bottom is only for the Baton Rouge agents. Uh, with return regards to um, returning a lockbox. Any questions on the early expiration? Okay. 
Fact and fiction. The first computer program in the world was a woman. Anybody know that answer? Y'all want to say yes, no? Yes. <laughs> You're right, it was. <laughs> Her name is Ada Lovelace, an English mathematician in the early, what is that, uh, 1800s. You can't look, can't see that, early 1800s. But that's who it was. Questions, y'all have been way too quiet on all these forms. I know this is the board topic <laughs> of forms, but we have to let y'all know and we have to go through them. So, uh, if you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer. For uh, uh, the um, despite the thing, um, and you said, let's say I get the photography and I pay someone for it, um, and they work to reimburse me, or okay, if it goes to Latin room first, um, the sovereign he would take any yeah. no, okay. Sometimes agents shoot one up. Buy your pictures. Yeah. They don't care. They can buy your pictures if, if you want to allow that. But if they don't, then they can't use your pictures that's in MLS. Yeah. They can't just take your listing and put those pictures in. That's a violation. Right. Those pictures are protected from the cross. Any other questions? Okay. I think, I think I'm done, y'all. And your QR code, fill out a survey. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>